Um, hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to another webinar in our storage technology series. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Hamad Ammar, system engineer and an open source specialist at Starline. I'm pleased to have you with, uh, with us today. Um, just a quick GBR heads up, especially for those who are joining us for the first time, um, because uh, we want to make this webinar available for other viewers later on. Um, who couldn't attend. We will be recording this session, so please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions, please use the chat function to communicate them to us. This way, we won't be violating any GBR rules. Um, let me also welcome Dominique Sun, the marketing director of our partners, Embedded. Um, hello, Dominique. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in this webinar. I know it's such a late hour in Taipei right now for you. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Hello, everyone. So, um, I will start um, with a quick recap uh, about CIF, followed by the challenges imposed by um, by CIF's own design, and a brief um, followed by a brief um, introduction to Embedded's um, answer. CIF is a software-defined storage platform, and it relies on software intelligence exaggerated number of hardware controllers and an increased number of disks. This helps keep your running cost down at a reasonable minimum. And within Ceph, everything is a software service uh, that runs on top of Linux operating system, on top of your hardware, target performance and budget. Uh, you can also use HDDs for data storage and SSDs for caching. So it, each OSD is backed up by um, an SSD for journaling and caching. And this can greatly improve your I.O. performance while saving you some good money. Um, you need as many of those OSDs as you could to guarantee good throughput and data resilience. And each OSD daemon um, will be paired with one of the physical disks you have in your servers. So if you have 100 physical hard drives, you will have 100 instances of the OSD daemon. The manager provides additional monitoring and interfaces uh, with external monitoring management systems. It runs parallel to the monitor. And the metadata server stores data on behalf of the CIF file system. You only need it if you plan on using CIF file system. And the gateway exports the data to external clients using standard access protocols such as iSCSI and NFS. And you basically need, need a gateway for any client that cannot directly connect to a Ceph cluster using Librados, which is the library that bonds clients to the Ceph cluster. The chassis that contains your OSD disks can also serve as a monitor, um, an M uh, MDS, or even as a gateway node. This is, again, because everything is a software service and you can run multiple instances of different services on the same um, hardware or the same node. Um, the cement which bonds all those components together is Crush, the algorithm that smartly manages data flow, redundancy, and regeneration of data within a Ceph cluster. The driving engine of Ceph is Crush. All members of any Ceph cluster can use and do rely on Crush uh, for their daily operations. Even Ceph clients can also use Crush. Um, they use it to quickly calculate how to, sh how to shard data and where to store this data on the Ceph cluster. This shifts some of the required processing away from the monitors, away from the actual storage nodes, and puts it on the client side, which helps improve Ceph cluster's performance. And Ceph's performance relies heavily on good, net good networking. Within a Ceph cluster, all services and nodes are always actively interacting with each other, over the network, always reporting their status and always aware of each other's status and function. CIF uses two main mechanisms to store data, replication and erasure coding. Replication is quite simple. We take one object, we make an X number of copies of it, and the default setting for CIF replication is three copies of each object that you want to store, store on the server or on the cluster. Erasure coding, on the other hand, takes one object, splits it into a number of data chunks, then calculates and adds a number of encoding chunks. Then all those pieces get stored into different OSDs. 
Ceph is also very flexible. You can have a cluster with multiple pools. Each pool has a different replication or erasure coding setup. So let, let's say that we had a stack of eight nodes or eight servers in one rack. We can um, configure this cluster. We can, we can run a Ceph cluster on those eight nodes and we can configure this cluster to run two pools. One is replicated at a 3x replica and one is erasure coded with a three plus two configuration, three pieces of data plus two base pieces of encoding chunks or redundancy chunks. Now, if we wanted to store one object into each pool, the data chunks will be sharded or distributed across, across all eight nodes. Each replica or code chunk of that object will be stored on a different node, and this is to increase data redundancy and to avoid single points of failure. You can now see that replication is more expensive disk space-wise because from each object of data, you need to create an X number of copies, three, four, or five. Uh, while erasure coding is more expensive CPU-wise because it's, ca it's a calculation process and it requires more CPU time. And this is basically how Ceph protects your data. It either replicates or fragments it among the highest possible number of OSDs. So um, in case one or more of those OSDs fails, a copy of your data would always still be there, um, would always still be accessible or recoverable. And while planning your Ceph cluster, it's very important to take note of those storage and computational overheads. And th this is basically what Ceph's main strategy is. Um, Ceph's main strategy is safety in numbers. The number of OSDs, the number of OSD nodes, the number of replicas, and the number of encoding chunks. The more you have, the safer your data is going to be. But to apply the logic of safety in numbers, you need to increase the number of OSD nodes. You need more chassis. You need more rack space and more electricity to power your, your server fleet. And for decades, the default go-to hardware architecture for open source storage has been the x86 hardware. Yes, it's powerful and abundant, but it comes with a relatively higher price tag. And it also consumes a significant amount of power which also translates to a higher annual energy bill. But sometimes, and for many applications such as S3 storage, backups, and um, uh, so many applications where you, where you don't really want that power, you need the right amount of performance with functionality, ease of management, and also high storage density. You need a smart solution that can allow you to enjoy all the benefits of Ceph while giving you the desired IOPS and desired storage capacity, avoids most of the single points of failure and weaknesses, and keeps your physical hardware stack slim and keeps you within budget. And this is exactly where Embedded steps in with their ARM-based storage solution. If you wanted to build your own x86 hardware, then you, then you are in for quite a challenge. You have a very short list of CPU providers, basically two, and a very limited array of parts to select from, and it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg. But then enters the ARM chip, the integrated chip that runs most of our modern digital hardware today. Everything from your mobile phone to your TV and even your car runs on a, a, an ARM chip, and they have some clear advantages over x86 hardware. Because they are compact with multiple cores and integrated peripherals, they are system on chip, which means simpler and more flexible hardware design. You can tailor your own bespoke hardware to make an application-specific solution, and they are also much cheaper because there is already more than 400 licensees out there making ARM chips. It's also a RISC processor, reduced instruction set processor. It's more efficient, it execute, executes instructions with significantly fewer transistors, resulting in lower power consumption at a relatively high CPU clocks. At Starline, we already have servers with 48 cores, ARM KVM CPUs that are running on 300 watts power supplies. And if you build performant and power efficient hardware, this translates immediately to uh, lower running costs. When you combine Ceph with ARM, 
you get a number of additional advantages. You get the application-specific hardware, a solution that is designed to run your software very well. You get compact hardware design, which enables um, higher rack density. You get better cost efficiency. The hardware itself is more cost efficient. It consumes much less power, which can make a huge difference for large-scale deployments, which translates into lower operating expenditures and lower capital expenses. So what did Embedded exactly do? How did they exploit the power of ARM to create a solution that actually stands out? Well, they took that stack of eight servers and they basically flattened it into a 1U form chassis. And how can you put eight independent servers in a 1U chassis? Well, they took one of those servers and they compacted it into an ARM module with a, with a quad-core 64-bit ARM CPU running at 1.6 gigahertz with four gigabytes of dedicated DDR4 RAM with 16 gigabytes of EMMC flash storage for the Linux operating system and with integrated on-chip dual 2.5 giga, gigabit Ethernet. Each module can also handle two SATA disks, SSD or HDD, at any capacity available on the market today. This way, each module becomes a microserver in itself. And this microserver is the core engine of the Mars 400 chassis. In each chassis, there are um, two redundant switches at the back of the chassis running at 20 gigabit second each with dual SFB or uh, RJ45 ports. Combined, they provide 40 gigabit per second throughput for, for chassis, per chassis. You have dual redundant 300 watt power supplies and eight bays for enterprise SATA disks for your OSDs. And because this is a CIF oriented design, there are eight M.2 flash bays for the OSD journals. Those OSDs are quite useful when you use rotating hard drives to build your CIF cluster because the SSD journals can help improve um, the cluster uh, I.O. Within this design, all components are redundant and everything is hot swappable. The backplane that connects all those components has no logic itself, and so it does not count as a single point of failure. The server is also powered by Linux and includes, includes upstream CIF binaries, and on top of that runs embedded unified management GUI, which facilitates cluster um, which facil facilitates cluster deployment and management. Um, using the latest enterprise drives from Toshiba or Seagate, we can have between 144 and 160 terabytes of raw storage per chassis. That's already more than um, half a petabyte per each four nodes cluster. Um, this is, in a nutshell, embedded out-of-the-box answer to the challenge an innovative and balanced solution with a thoughtful hardware co composition, um, a building block uh, for CIF clusters that is uh, complemented with a feature-rich management interface. Um, this was, was my brief um, overview uh, of the solution, and I leave you now with Dominique Sun, the marketing director of our partners, Embedded. She will give you a more detailed insight into the architecture of the Mars 400 solution. So, Dominique, um, please take over. Okay, sure. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's Dominic Sun, uh, Sales Marketing Director from Embedded Technology. Thanks, Arma, for introducing uh, the safe storage, also the idea about our ARM-based platform. So for the following section, I will go deeper for our uh, safe storage turnkey solution and what the benefit it could bring to the IT users for the safe cluster. So, as Alma say, we are leverage the uh, ARM-based microserver to become a one-new chassis solution. So, inside this unit, uh, there is eight microserver, and each microserver, just as Alma say, is an independent Linux server. That means each microserver they could be defined as the OSD monitor node or MDS node, even for the gateway node for the set cluster. And one unique thing that we bring out for this design is one microserver to one data disk. So for each microserver, it only dedicates to one data disk. 
uh, it could be 2.5 inch SSD or 3.5 inch hard drive, and also one dedicated journal disk for the set cluster. And for this entire unit, exclude the hard drive disk. The total power consumption on full loading, it will not over the 105 watts. But on the normal operation for the data rewrite, it will be only 60 or 70 watts per unit, which is much less than a general server in the market. The general server in the market, it might uh, more than 300 or 400 watts very easily. So as we know, Ceph is an IP-based uh, storage. Everything is communicated through the TCP IP. So the communication is quite important. For this reason, we have designed two in chassis switch. Uh, as you can see, there is two switch module here, uh, switch A and switch B. And every module, it could provide two times uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet pole. It's a combo port design. So the user, they could either use the RJ45 or the SFT plus connector. So for the so for the intrinsic switch, we have two options to do the configuration. The default one is what we recommend always to our customer is to separate the in-cluster and the public network for this safe appliance. For this configuration, it could bring better performance for the rewrite performance. Also, it's very higher reliability. But with this school, uh, we need to have the cluster unit number more than four units. That means to have four or four plus units. And another option, uh, the option two for the network configuration inside mass 400 is to have the bonding mode. The bonding mode means to have the two Ethernet bonded together for each microserver module, then connect to, to the two in chassis switch module. With this option, the user, they could even lose one of the switch module, but the entire cluster will not get impact. With this design, uh, it's more flexible to use the less quantity of the unit. However, the, there is a compromise is to have the rewrite performance, it will be less good than the default configuration, as we say, the separate mode. So that's the uh, detail for the mass 400. So what's the benefit or what's the advantage to run the set cluster on this uh, architecture compared to the traditional general server in the market? We could conclude as five major advantage. The first one is it provides the smallest value domain uh, on the hardware value. As you can see, the general uh, x86 server, if you fail one server multiple, it could bring a bunch of the disk fail on the same time. Even you run the set cluster, you have the auto recovery. However, uh, the network traffic for this auto recovery, it will get much burden for the production service. But if running the set cluster on the on-base microserver architecture, when you lose one microserver, only one data disk will get impact. And uh, even for the auto recovery or self-healing in the set storage, the network traffic impact is much, much less compared to the general server design. And second, uh, the micro server architecture, it runs one processor, one single test. So for one OSD or for the monitor or the MDS, they always have the dedicated processor memory and the Ethernet. The workload can be very balanced. In this design, there is no highway resource raising in the competition and the memory resource doesn't need to be allocated. So there is no uh, memory raising as well. As a result, this could get higher performance and the better stability when run the set cluster, also for the linear scale out. 
And another good advantage is this design, it could bring up to deploy a set cluster, even with three units or four units. We see for three units, uh, the user they could define one monitor per unit and the others runs the OSD. And the three unit, it already could achieve a high availability set cluster. Starting from the fourth unit, uh, the user they, they could populate, they could define all, only for the OSD. So with the first unit, if any one of the chassis fail, the auto recovery still have the third, if we run the replica three, it also still have the third unit to have the data recovery. But with the general x86 design, uh, for OS node is necessary, recommended by the set uh, from the set community and the three monitor node. So as a total, the user like, need to invest at least seven units for the initial investment. And another significant advantage is for the power consumption. We have done a comparison for the five years operation for the power consumption. As a result, uh, it's one petabyte self-storage cluster running on x86 server and our mass 400 on this micro server cluster. So we see the total power requirement at least for five years. Um, running on the general server is more than 10 kilowatts. And running on our on-base micro server is about 4,000 watts. So we could set about 60% energy saving for the power cooling and the power consumption in total. If convert to the electricity fee, the power fee, for these five years are uh, running the set storage one petabyte, our design, it could save more than 70, about 80K euros. So still related to the power, we know uh, the on-base micro server platform is more power saving. So for one single rake cabinet with the 5 kVA power limit in one break, uh, we could accommodate about 30 units of the mass 400 with 240 OSD disk. But the same power consumption upper limit on the general server, it only to accept about nine units or 10 units for about 144 OSD. So we could achieve a higher OSD density. So one rate with more OSD, with more capacity and uh, saving more power. So as a conclusion, you could see on um, this MAS400 on-base micro server platform, it has five significant advantage, um, the smallest value domain and the most stable and the uh, better performance since it's a dedicated resource one-to-one -one, uh, architecture. And also it could reduce uh, the user's initial investment to bring up a safe cluster, but still with high availability. And then for the power, uh, it could save more than 60% of the power utility on your safe cluster. So the more capacity you have with your safe cluster, the more power fee you save for your production. And then, we could also reduce your rake cabinet quantity since you could accommodate more OSD disk into the our own server. So uh, we see the logic of the set. Then we see the advantage on running set on the on-base micro server platform. So embedded proposed the market or turnkey solution, which is a combination of the on-base micro server platform. And uh, we have a uh, preload uh, Ubuntu long-term support operating system with the tuning Linux kernel, then loading the self community storage version, which is 100% compatible upstream version and the tune and the optimize by embedded team. And on top of this is the set manager Magui, which we call it UVS manager. This could lower down the entry barrier 
for the users who is not so familiar to Ceph, who is not so experienced to Ceph. So they could use the this fully uh, distributed storage with the benefit, but they don't need to learn deeper for the Ceph. And for the Tanky solution, besides the combination of the Ceph, ARM-based microserver and the GUI system, we also offer the professional service for the software maintenance. Uh, and the, with this software maintenance is including uh, the profession support and the consultancy of your planning on the self cluster. Also the regular software upgrade package to provide to the customer. And this could, the standard is for three years and this could extend to five years by customer request. So before we go to uh, introduce and demo our UVS manager, uh, we just need to think about when you are going to plan your self cluster, what's the most important thing that we need to preview in our mind? The first thing is the user need to think about uh, your use scenario, your application, you are using the block, fire, or object storage for your application. And uh, what's your performance expectation? You are IOPS oriented or bandwidth required. And then you need to have which kind of network topology. Uh, your budget able to have a high availability network topology. And then define the performance expectation so you could choose the suitable disk type, uh, either the hard drive or SSD, or you could mix them together. Then we could calculate the corresponding OSD disk number so you could know your initial capacity uh, for the phase one or for your overall operation. Then with all of this information, you could also think about your protection master. As Arma explained, you could use replication or you could use erasure coding. It's a consideration for your performance and your capacity and your budget. Then you need to do a compromise to achieve the idea. Then when we know initially the usable capacity you require to have, then you could get the draft idea how many appliances uh, for example, if you are going to adapt embedded solution for the appliance, then you could calculate how many units you, you need to have or how many general server you might need. So the budget versus the availability, the performance and the capacity uh, of your expectation, this is what everyone needs to think before go deeper to plan your self cluster. So here I have one example, uh, just do a very simple uh, demo on the thinking of playing your cluster. For example, if you are today, if you today are uh, your application, you need to use the replica three, you have the choice to starting on uh, two unit or three unit or four unit of the appliance. However, with different unit, you have different results for your uh, risk diversity and your high availability. For example, if you want to use the replica three, but just two unit, and then the most of thing you could achieve and the tolerate is you could have two disks fail on the same time or two micro server fail on the same time without any data lost. But if you are lost, uh, two disks on the same time, your service might be locked. But if you are running uh, replica three on three unit, in this case, then you could diverse your risk level to different chassis, not the different disk as two unit. And then in this case, the worst scenario you could tolerate is you could lose entire chassis. You could lose one chassis. But since you only have three units, so you lose one chassis, you, your data still safe. You still running the service, but you will on the degrade mode, the system will give you the alert all the time to remind you like you need to have the third chassis as well. And the last uh, scenario is you're running replica three, but you only have 
you have four units. In this case, it's more flexible and the availability is better. So your crush rule, your risk diversity is into each chassis, each unit. When you lose one unit, you don't need to worry uh, if your capacity is still uh, a set to the auto recovery. And when you lose two chassis, it might have two uh, condition. One is if two monitor allocate onto these two chassis, then your data still set, but your service will be locked. It's to warn you, okay, you are, have certain risk level, but if these two fail chassis on the same time only have one monitor now, then the service still going on and the data still keeps set. So it's a compromise of your protection method and the quantity of your unit and the, your crush rule design. This is just a simple uh, demonstration on how to plan and how to think about uh, your budget and uh, your application. So for the later slide, I will show you a go through on the UVS manager. With the time limit, we will not show everything, but with embedded UVS manager, uh, the user, they could have the almost 95% of the set function. So the most important one is uh, they could do the set deployment and the configuration with the UVS manager. So they could deploy the set cluster from scratch, from zero, then adding monitor OSD, MDS gateway, all through the UVS manager. And the gateway server, including to deploy the gateway on the internal gateway or on the external general server gateway. And then they could define the crash map and the crash rule, we will see later, and create a pool image with the protection method they prefer. And also, uh, the user could use the UVS manager uh, to have the cluster management for different protocol, for the block, for the fire, and for the object storage, and have the cluster monitoring. We could provide OD log on the UVS. We could output log to premises and output log to the SMP as well. So the user, they could choose the most uh, preferable one. And then the most interesting thing on the UVS manager, it could simplify your cluster maintenance and the software upgrade at, even after the production service. I will show you a go through for that. So uh, we will show two major things on this go through on UVS manager. The first thing is to deploy your cluster. The second thing is upgrade your set cluster after it goes on production. If anyone you are interested in more detail on the UVS demo and the functionality, you could contact AMA Starlight to have the one-to-one -one demo. So let's start with the deployment. Um, the standard procedure is uh, we plan your network topology. This is very critical since the network is the fundamental thing for the set cluster. Then preload the disk to your OSD. Then configure the BMC IP and the node IP on the MAS400 appliance. And then you could start to bring up the set cluster with the UVS manager. Once this complete, you could operate your set cluster without any worry. The entire procedure for experience one, uh, it will take you about one hour to complete everything, to bring up a set cluster with 200 to 300 terabyte capacity. It's a very simple procedure. So for the network planning, we recommend our user to have the high availability network planning. So to switch on peering uh, is what we re recommended always. And also we recommend the user to have four tons of the 10 gigabits pro connected to the top of the rig switch. So this could provide a higher availability. Then load the disk to your MAS400 appliance. Uh, just be aware of, you only need to load the disk to the OSD node 
For the monitor, no, MDS, no, even for the gateway server, no, you don't need to have the hard drive or SSD. So only for the data, no, you need to preload the disk. Then use uh, the command line interface uh, through the BNC module to configure your IP address for the BNC, also for the eight micro server module inside the Mass 400 appliance. Once this is done, then we could log into the UVS manager, then just key in the monitor node IP you prefer to have, then create the first, uh, the first monitor node. Once the first monitor node are uh, established, then we could use uh, UVS manager to add more monitor node, just need to have the IP address of the corresponding micro server. Then once the monitor node were established, then define your crash map through the UVS manager. So you could define you have three cabinet or you have three chassis or you have three data center. In this case, uh, we just demonstrate three different chassis. And once you define your crash map, then you could define your crash rule. Is the crash is by host or by uh, server chassis? or by data center or by uh, rig cabinet, which is very flexible depending on the size, the scale of your set cluster. Once the crash map and the crash rule has been defined, then we could add the OSD node into this cluster on the UVS manager. You could just enter a page of the IP address of your OSD node IP then our UVS manager will run on the service automatically on the background once the cluster has been established. So when all the OSD node has been added into your cluster, 95% uh, of this cluster has been well deployed. And the rest of the work is to create the corresponding pool. You want the replica pool or erasure coding pool, then you choose, you create a pool with the protection master differently. Then define all the parameter to create this pool, to create this pool. Uh, so placement number, group, placement group number, and uh, the size of your replication. And also uh, this is for RBD or for the ZFS or for the object storage and apply the crash rule. Remember we previously, we defined the crash rule and the crash rule, it could have multiple if you define multiple crash rule on the menu as well. Then choose this pool, you need to have the compression uh, function or not. And what's the ratio of the compression you require to have. So once this has been done, you have everything to run your service to have your data rewrite into this safe cluster. So it's a very simple procedure. We try to help the user to lower down all the troublesome or all the complicated procedure and to have the safe cluster to use very quickly. And the second uh, demonstration uh, is how to upgrade the software on a production safe cluster. With our turnkey solution, the user, they don't need to worry about, okay, which version and what parameter I need to change and what things I need to tune for my production set cluster. Since we do everything, embedded team will do the modification and the verification on the new version release. And the new version, it could have the modification on the operating system and the kernel, or a set version or a UVS version, all these can be upgraded through the UVS manager interface. So on the UVS manager, there is a firmware upgrade menu. You could see your current version of every node function for your monitor node, for your OSD node, for your gateway server node. You could know the version on them. Then with this overview, you could choose the node like you want to do the upgrade the service. Then using the page fire, using the UPD fire or the compression fire provided by embedded or embedded partner like Starlight, then upload those fire onto the UVS manager, then push them into the cluster. 
you don't need to load to every node. You just need to load to one node and push to all the other selected node. It's quite simple and easy. And once you press push, then you could just uh, take a rest. Then the system, I mean, the UVS manager will do this on a running mode uh, to upgrade the cluster with one by one microservice. So this will not interrupt your production service. So um, since it's a compact solution, it's a tanky solution with the platform, with the tuning set, with the management GUI. So what we could use these devices, this equipment uh, for the real case uh, in the storage market. The set uh, is support, is a unified storage. Is support the native support protocol is the RBD for the block or Rados S3 for the object storage. Also, the set file system uh, is for the shared file system. Also, it's native support as a backend storage for the OpenStack and the Kubernetes for the CSI container storage interface. Besides this native support protocol, Seth also uh, allow the user to use the legacy storage, the traditional storage protocols such like the NFS, Senba, and iSCSI. And all of this, uh, we will require to have a gateway server to convert the Ceph native protocol into the legacy storage such like iSCSI, Senba, and the NFS to your use. For the external gateway, uh, to co-work with the MAS 400 appliance. Embedded also provide the software package for that. So the user, they only need to prepare a virtual machine or a physical server uh, with this requirement. Then you could use the UVS manager uh, to explore, to deploy this gateway service. So um, the basic requirement, hardware requirement for the external gateway is uh, Ubuntu uh, long-term support version, uh, more than four core processor, and uh, more than 64 GB memory, and at least dual 10 gigabits network. So here uh, is a conclusion. It's a summary for the different protocol uh, self support and the uh, but we should pay attention for the use case. So for the first three, the RBD object and the set file system, those are the native support. And for this native support, their availability is fully distributed. Um, there is no bottleneck over the gateway server. But for the iSCSI with the MAS 400 appliance, we provide a multi-page I.O. For the NFS, we provide the active passive standby. And for the same bar, we provide the CTBD for the cluster trivial database. And also um, for those protocol, no matter native or legacy storage, uh, the major, the main use of uh, client operating system, RBD and the set file system is more for the Linux client. And for the object, it could adapt and the tolerate most of the operating system. For the iSCSI, is most of case, the customer, they are using Windows or VMware. And for the NFS and the Senba, it's most of the operating system is acceptable. So another interesting thing on the Ceph and also on the UV, on the MAS 400 appliance uh, is for the disaster recovery uh, user if they are using the RBD or iSCSI or NFS or SEMBA, this protocol, we could always use the RBD mirroring to provide the DR function. If they are using the object storage or the S3, then we could provide the multi-site active active support for the bucket data sync. So this is for the customer who owns the cluster on different side. They are interesting to do this. Here I have two use case to share with you. We know uh, we have the legacy storage to support. We have the native support protocol on set as well. So 
for the legacy storage, a lot of the customer today, they like to consider self as a scale on us with no limitation, with very flexibility and scale out anytime. So this new scenario is in Taiwan. Is the customer, they have very sensible data for the CCTV data. They want to have the surveillance data and the layer service data backup into the safe cluster by using the NFS protocol. And they have two sites, two data center. So the major data center is for to store uh, all the uh, first tier data. And the secondary data center is only for the backup service. So since, you know, for the CCTV and the backup data, the performance is not so demanding. So we just provide the MAS 400 appliance with the erasure coding uh, for plus two, then use the crash rule by Chessie. In this design, they could allow any two of the units to fail on the same time without any worry of loss of data. And another example is uh, to provide the native support. It's not the iSCSI or NFS. It's the Ceph RBD, a block storage uh, to provide us the backend storage to the OpenStack platform. So these customer, they are in Indonesia. They have several data center. So it's one OpenStack platform across three data center, three different city in Indonesia. One open one open stack platform, and the, each data center has its dedicated and independent self cluster. So three self cluster independently. Uh, however, uh, the data center one and the data center two, they are using the RBD mirroring for the glance image, and also customer they are use the data backup for the DC one to the DC three and from the DC2 to the DC3 as well. With this use scenario, since it's for the open stack, so the customer, they are using the protection master is replica three and the cross rule by Chessie, since they have more than uh, three unit per each data center. So this is the actual scenario using Ceph with the open stack with multiple sites. So, this is the two use case I want to share with you. And for today's uh, webinar section, this is what I want to share with everyone. Um, this is my part. I finished my part. So maybe any one of you have the question? Thank you, Dominique, for this uh, interesting uh, overview of the solution and the integration scenarios and uh, the UVS2. Thank you. So, um, yeah. this is a QA and, and part. When um, should uh, any of the uh, audience have a question about the solution or SIF in general? Um, please ask it in the chat and we will try to answer it. Yeah. So thanks, Dominic, and thanks, Amar, um, for these great presentations. And thank you for the audience for staying tuned. My name is Bernd from uh, Sales at Starline. And uh, now I personally understand also much more about Ceph and the benefits and how embedded solution can cover high availability storage demand uh, as well on a cost efficient side as also on a power saving uh, way. Um, as Amar mentioned, uh, we have a question and answer sessions. As also mentioned, to follow the GDPR law, we have to do that uh, in the chat window. And of course, we are more than happy to have your or get your questions also in an email after the actual webinar. So feel free, put your um, questions in, either German or English, and we are more than happy to answer them now. So please go ahead. We just give you a little time. Um, there are a couple of questions already. There is um, there is one about um, the possibility of uh, purchasing UVS software support separately. So, um, Dominique, is it possible for uh, customers to purchase UVS software support separate from the hardware? Um, for this part, uh, it's possible for our UVS version three, uh, which we will launch very soon this year. But not for now. Uh, 
probably in the middle of this year. Okay. Um, another question is, what is the biggest advantage of embedded over other SIF solutions for the customer besides the uh, economy uh, or the economical arm technology? Okay, I think uh, I explained the advantage on the uh, microserver platform, so I will now repeat here. And also, um, the UVS manager, uh, I know a lot of the, not a lot, but several of our, um, you know, for the company who work on the same uh, self storage, everyone has offered uh, their GUI management. And yeah. also Southland is the appliance solution, but embedded the uniqueness uh, apart from all these competitor, maybe I could say, um, there are several things. The first thing, of course, is our platform, microserver architecture. We are the only one who run in this architecture. And uh, secondary, on uh, the UVS manager, uh, maybe for most of people, they will think the UVS manager, they could only run in on the on-base microserver. But, but as I say, uh, in a couple of months later, Actually, this UVS manager, it will adapt both the, our own platform and the general server, if you want to use the general server. And the third thing I think is something we are very different from the others is our professional service support. Uh, we are not selling a platform to the customer. We are selling a service. We are offering a service to the customer so we could engage from the beginning. If customer, they are willing to share their plan about this cluster, the, no, the more we know, then the more we could have the consultancy with our customer. And uh, also for the software upgrade is a very interesting part with the UVS manager as well. Uh, since we are not selling only the software, we are selling the tanky solution. So when we have the upgrade version release is well tuned and well verified with our platform. So customer, they don't need to face a lot of the troublesome thing uh, compared to if they are doing the DIY by themselves or they are only purchase the GUI management from the other company. There is um, another question. One more. Is there a, a limit to how big the hard drive could be, um, how big the hard drive that could be plugged um, into the future? For now, um, we have um, for now we have 18 or 20 terabytes. The 18 the 18 is the latest from Toshiba, and the 20 is the latest from Seagate. But for example, if there is like a 30 terabyte drive in the future, is there a theoretical limit that the micro server can handle? Um, theoretically should be able to handle, but we still need to test because yeah. for every, uh, we qualify, uh, Toshiba and the Seagate hard drive, uh, since we have done the testing for every drive, we preload together with the mass 400. Yeah. Okay. So theoretically I could say yes, but still need to do the verified testing. Okay, um, one more question is, uh, what is the recommended uh, capacity for the M.2? Uh, the M.2 is already preloading with the mass 400 appliance. And for, the, for today's shipment to the customer, we are using 120 GB M.2 for each micro server. So okay. inside one unit, you have about one TB and that two already. Um, you you mean one terabyte distributed like between between all um, eight OSDs, so one hundred um, by eight. It's one one hundred twenty times eight, so it's nearby the one terabyte. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? 
no. So I think uh, we could conclude this webinar now. And thank you so much, Dominique, for joining us. Um, in spite of it being so late uh, over there in Taipei. And thank you for um, all our audience who attended this session. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any uh, um, further questions, please feel free to get in touch with us, um, either through info at starline.de or my direct email. It's on the screen right now, m.amar at starline.de. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, see you soon. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Amar.